thank you very much. You know, I was really excited when Lisa called and asked me to be a part of this, not just because she says nice things about me, but because I appreciate the work that Alec does so much. And also because almost everybody else you're going to hear in these few days at this event are going to be talking about really important substance things. I just talk about sales. I talk about messaging. Now, I love policy. I would love to talk about it all day, but in terms of, of my role in this, it's to talk about how do we sell ideas more effectively. And as a simple rule of thumb, any issue that you're talking about at this conference, don't ever talk like that to people outside, to the general public. <laughs> Let me give an example. CRT, critical race theory. You know what? Most voters do not know what it means. So if you talk about the issue of CRT or critical race theory, you've already lost them. It would be as if I were to say to you, I think you should follow in your daily life and in your legislative career the lessons of Luke 10, 25 to 37. Does that mean a lot to you? But if I said, I think a great role model is the story of the Good Samaritan. Everybody knows it, whether you're Christian or not. You want to talk in terms that people understand. You want to connect with the people. It's your responsibility to communicate. It is not their responsibility to understand your terminology. Now, I loved it when Senator Santorum earlier today talked about the importance of federalism. He's absolutely right. Um, in fact, it's one of the bedrock principles of our republic, a key part of our system of checks and balances. But if you talk to people about federalism who are not wrapped up in politics, they do not know what it means. It's just not a part of a daily dialogue. So I would talk about, and by the way, those comments were totally appropriate for this group because this group gets it. Um, and there's another reason that it's important to talk to this group about it. 68% of voters say decisions are best made at state and local levels rather than the federal government. Um, don't get a big head about that. 74% believe the federal government is a special interest group that looks out for itself. So basically they're saying you're not as bad. Uh, but, but that does give you a responsibility to try and serve more effectively. But if I was talking to people outside of this room about federalism, what I would do is I'd tell a simple story right now from my own life in the last couple of years. You've probably all heard of this pandemic that's been raging around the country. When it began, I was living in Manhattan. It was pretty bad there. And after a while, it got so bad that we became part of the great exodus and moved to Florida. Florida has wildly different pandemic rules than New York City, and I was grateful for federalism, for the principle that would let me go have control over my life and go to a place where I could live like I wanted to live. But it's not just that side of it. That same principle also let a lot of people in Manhattan stay there because that's the way they felt safer. It's not my job to say whether they're right or wrong. It's not their job to say whether I'm right or wrong. We both made the choice that we wanted to make. That's why federalism is important. That's why it's important that we keep um, control at the state level as much as possible. Now, I've spent the last two months working with Steve Moore and the America First Policy Institute uh, and a number of other organizations in the uh, Save America Coalition, trying to kill the big government socialism bill. And my role in that has been exactly the same. It's to talk about what people are really thinking and hearing about the bill. Uh, to begin with, most Americans aren't talking about it. Only 19% of voters, one out of five voters, knows that the infrastructure bill passed and the other bill didn't. They're just not paying attention because there have been so many trillion dollar bills, they all start to sound the same. You know, and somebody like Steve Moore may know the difference between a million and a trillion, but I don't, and nobody else does either. So we said, let's not talk about the dollars. Because if I 
tell somebody it's going to cost this much, it doesn't really connect. We want to start talking about the policies. What are people going to do with these dollars? And right away, and I'm sure everybody in this room can come up with what they think are stupid ideas, we had a bunch of ideas suggested as these are really offensive things in this bill. One of them was, you may not know this, there's a provision in the bill for tree equity, two and a half billion dollars to plant trees. Uh, but you know what? Doesn't poll all that badly. There's a provision for a climate conservation core. That doesn't pull all that badly either. So we don't want to talk about those things because why would you? But if you begin to change the way you describe it a little bit, you know what the climate of the, seat, the new CCC would be? Is funding for more than, or more than 750,000 people hired from environmental activist groups to go and knock on the doors to give you an energy audit. When you tell people that there will be an army of people funded by the federal government going to knock on their door, they don't like it. Ronald Reagan still rules. You know, the most dangerous words, the most frightening words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. So you talk about it in the right way. When we began to apply that a little bit further, Steve Moore said, wow, this provision about doubling the number of IRS agents, that's going to get people. It didn't. It actually, a slight plurality said, yeah, we like that idea, why not? However, when we talked about the provision that would give the IRS more access to your bank account, only 19% supported it, 73% opposed it. And when we went on to say what that means is if you spend $601 to buy a gun, the IRS will have a record of it. If you give money to a troubled group or troubling group, troublesome group like ALEC, they will have a record of it. If you give to a church or a pro-life organization, they will have a record of it. That's what made these provisions offensive. So that's the way we have to talk about it. Steve would tell me, Steve Moore would say, this is terrible because we're going to have the highest marginal tax rate in the world. And you know, he's right. I think that's terrible. But I would never make that argument because it doesn't work. People's eyes glaze over. So the point of all of this is we want to talk about things that connect with people. When we talk about inflation, it's not an economist issue. It's not a theoretical issue. Half of all Americans live paycheck to paycheck. What inflation means to them is when they put 20 bucks more into the gas tank, they have 20 bucks less to spend on groceries. And for people who are a little better off, it means instead of going out to eat once a week, they stay home now. That's the real world impact of inflation. And that's the way you need to reach out to people on all issues. Now I can go on and on with a list of other things about this bill. You know, it overturns the Hyde Amendment, so it, it would provide federal funding for abortions. Uh, it has some bizarre provisions that would get the uh, faith-based providers out of daycare and child care provisions. Uh, it has a provision in there that would let you get fa paid family leave funded by the federal government even if you don't have a job. I don't know what you need to leave from if you're not working, <laughs> but they're going to pay you for it. So what does this do in terms of state legislative issues? One of the big issues that's taking place in America right now, obviously, is election reform, election integrity. There are three issues that are basic reforms that are supported by more than 80% of all voters. These three reforms should be the center of any effort to restore confidence in our system of elections, requiring photo ID, before anybody can cast a ballot is one. A second one, forget all the details about mail-in voting and other pieces of it, eight, more than 80% of voters believe every ballot should be in by election day. If it comes in afterwards, doesn't count. And a third one, is a requirement that states clean the voter rolls before every election. 
couple of things about this, though. There was some legislation being considered in Congress earlier this year, passed the House, didn't get anywhere in the Senate, that would have eliminated all three of those topics. They would have made it illegal, or not, not technically illegal, they would have said if you show up without a photo ID, you can sign a letter saying you're eligible to vote, and that counts. So they would have banned the use of photo ID as an effective uh, tool for restoring confidence in elections. There was a provision that prohibited states from cleaning their voter rolls in the last six months before any election. And there was a provision requiring states to allow any ballots that came in up to 15 days after an election to be counted. And by the way, just to be clear, a lot of people in Congress voted for that. So these are fundamental provisions that, first of all, the decision should be made at the state. It's great if you were out championing reform and talking about these issues, but the way you talk about it is important. Number one thing when you talk about election reform, it has nothing to do with Donald Trump. Back in the 1990s, some of you remember those days, back in the 1990s I was polling when Bill Clinton was president and half of all Americans thought that elections were fair to voters, just half. Turns out Democrats thought they were fair, Republicans disagreed. George W. Bush got elected. 50% still said they supported, uh, they thought elections were fair. This time it was Republicans who thought it was fair and Democrats who didn't. I was talking with Walter Blackman about this at breakfast. You know, this, this sense that there is a problem um, it, it just popped up recently is wrong. We've had this problem now for decades. It's gotten worse. As we are here today, a majority of Democrats continue to believe that Hillary Clinton was the legitimate winner of the 2016 election. And a majority of Republicans believe that Donald Trump was the legitimate winner in 2020. What that means is only one out of four voters thinks the right person was named president in both 2016 and 2020. That's not a partisan issue. That's a real crisis for a nation that is supposed to be founded on principles of consent of the governed. That is a problem that we need to address to restore confidence in the founding ideals of our nation. So when we talk about it, we shouldn't be talking about what happened the last election or anything in particular we should be talking about what are sound principles of reform. What are the ideas that would make it easy to vote and then hard to cheat? And let's not talk about creating the perfect, you know, everybody in here probably has their pet peeve about elections. Let's just focus on the big issues. Let's require photo ID. Let's make sure voter rolls are clean. Let's make sure the ballots are in by election day. And after that happens, well, then we can see what the next steps are. When we talk about elections, obviously that's one of the hot topics, and the election in Virginia a few weeks ago showed that education is another hot topic. I've already mentioned that um, critical race theory is not something that people talk about and know about. Uh, what really drove that education part of that was the fact that School boards, parents, school boards, and one of the candidates for governor said parents shouldn't be playing this role in their children's education. They shouldn't have the right to decide to tell schools what to teach their kids. Obviously problematic. Um, I did some polling for Freedom Works in Pennsylvania on this issue, and we began to explore little bits of what that meant. And something that might surprise a few people in here. Um, came up. Turns out a solid majority of voters have a favorable opinion of their local school board. And a favorable, uh, a solid majority have a favorable opinion of their local teachers union. But they still think parents need a bigger say. A solid majority said that school boards, not parents, school boards should decide whether students wear masks or are vaccinated or any other policies like that. So how does that square with the idea that parents should have more control? At the same time, they said that 
that uh, the school board should have this authority, they said every parent should have the right to send their child to a school that meets their needs. So if the school board picks one approach, you should be able to send your child to another school at no extra cost. We're not talking about vouchers here. We're not talking about a specific detailed policy mechanism. We're simply talking about a system of checks and balances. School boards are a respected part of our constitutional order. They're local elected officials. People want to respect them. They want to have those judgments made, but they also want to have the choice to, to send their children to a school that fits their needs. For an issue like this, our tone matters a lot. And sometimes people get so carried away with the idea of parental control, they forget what it would mean to leave out the school boards from this process. You know, earlier I mentioned that when I was uh, living in New York and I could move to Florida, it was great for me to have that choice, but it was also good that somebody who wanted to stay in New York had that choice. If the decision was entirely up to parents, there would be no place for parents who wanted their kids to wear masks to go to school or who wanted a vaccination policy. Because if every parent could decide for themselves, there'd be a hodgepodge at every school. So the idea of having this system, well, I talked about this earlier, my phone, many years ago, I didn't know how to turn my phone off when, I, when that happened, so I'm learning about it. Um, when, when school boards make these decisions, it gives you an opportunity, or it gives our system an opportunity to make a choice available to everyone. And that's something we ought to focus on. So how do you, the, the question should not be, how do we give parents absolute control and get school boards out of the mix? The question should be, what kind of policies can we implement that would let parents have the final decision in terms of how their children are being taught? And there's an interesting twist on this that I think we're all in danger of missing. What's happened in the last couple of years, parents have seen a lot more about what goes on in the education system. Something else that's happened is they've begun to get used to some different things. Right now, among people who believe the worst, among parents who believe the worst of the pandemic is behind us, people who think, you know, we should be safe now, we should be able to get back to normal, a significant number of them are also saying they want a hybrid system of education, a mix of in-person and virtual education. Why? It's not because they're afraid of their kid getting sick. It's because, well, you know, we're going to a, a family event next week. It'd be great if on Thursdays and Fridays we could have the chance to let our child uh, take their classes on a virtual basis. Or we have a family vacation coming up. Parents are beginning to say, look at education differently. It's a great opportunity, and this is going to reshape education. We're not going to figure out how to do it. Parents will as they begin to negotiate all these choices. And I think that's the, that's the way that parents ultimately have control in the process. And if I was a state legislator, rather than thinking about how to sell a policy that I've been trying to sell for the last 10 years, I would think about what's education look like in this new world. Now I'm gonna close in just a minute. Uh, and I, before I do that, I wanna say, if you go to my website at scottrasmussen.com, you can get a newsletter anytime and I'll be around the rest of the conference if you wanna talk about anything. Uh, I wanna to talk to people about how to message effectively uh, on issues that are important to them. But I wanna talk about something in a very big picture way. For many, many years, people have said that the political right is about freedom and the political left is about equality. The great tragedy in our political system today is that many people on the left have abandoned the idea of equality. They want to pursue equity instead. We need a system with both freedom and equality. We need people who will lift up both sides of that equation. And a lot of times conservatives get kind of uncomfortable talking about equality. I would encourage you to uh, read de Tocqueville's Democracy in America. You don't even have to get through the first paragraph before he says the most essential thing you have to understand about Americans is their sense of equality. 
Um, he was talking about it in terms of equality of standing before the law, equality of opportunity. Uh, he knew it was flawed and imperfect, but we need to reclaim all of those ideals. And the encouraging news is 85% of voters believe that America was founded on the ideals of freedom, equality, and self-governance. They look back on our nation, they don't see something that's evil and horrible. What they see is a nation that has made a lot of mistakes. We've had some serious challenges, especially in the area of racial injustice. But they also see a nation that is making progress towards those goals. And what makes this really exciting is 83% of voters believe that America's founding ideals are worth fighting for. And I'm one of those 83% and I hope that you are too. Thank you very much.